chante dans le rap français, c'est la crise On a grillé la chétanerie et son nom brise Tête chaud, dans la fin, qu'il le corps à l'us Le monde est faux, c'est ça, ça fait que ça est maître Terroriste, j'suis un terroriste Moi-même en premier, tous les jours, oui, every day. La suite, je vais vous rafaler. Au Bataclan, au Stade de France, à l'Olympia ou en face. Dans le mal, Mike, que je te fasse. Vous savez, blabla, t'es. Parlez, parlez, pour les bouquets. Quand tu n'es astigmatisé, quand ça va péter, il faudra fumer. Portez ton coup vos couilles. Il vous mettre la douille. Tout comme Disney. C'est une vie tout niqué. Pourtant, c'est pas compliqué. Ah, ah, tu t'es un. Voyons, voyons. Voyons, 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 voyons Fais venir ton maillot, fais tomber le bras d'un autre Laissez votre nez des talons, je souhaite le étalon Gravir mes fesses, je suis long, je laisse tes potes Relations, et le bras long, ça c'est sale, je vise à ton ennemi Tu fais la vie, tout c'est pas y'a fond Je combattrai ces gens qui t'as fini en bouton Qui le mine à fuse Terroriste, je suis un terroriste Le rap game, je le terroriste Je parle vrai, ça les traumatise je combat tous ces satanistes Je suis un guerre, je suis un diaguiste Terroriste, je suis un terroriste Diaguiste, je suis un diaguiste Dieu chose dans le rap français, c'est la crise On a grillé la chétanerie et son en bruge T'aimes chou, dans l'air froid, qu'il le coalise Le mensonge qui procrisie, ça il maîtrise Discrédité qu'il le munati, c'est l'objet Trollé, 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 trollé Un temps rap game, je l'emmène Ton buzz, tu peux te le mettre Tout sort ta mère J'suis le rabaleux Fais-en ce que tu veux Rien à foutre au percé J'suis venu te cracher La porte une vérité Tu crois être rusé Qui est seulement la risée Tu es terrorisé C'est ce qui est te viser Reste tranquille C'est que le début Repose en pièce Chabu De la part de mes négros barbus Terroriste J'suis un terroriste Le rap game Je le terroriste Je parle vrai je combat tous ces satanistes Je suis un guerre, je suis un diaguiste Terroriste, je suis un terroriste Diaguiste, je suis un diaguiste Je l'ai terroriste Quoi, quoi, quoi
to All Hell Can't Stop Us, the extended version. This is a little bit of a later episode, so I decided to do something a little bit different there. That was the full version of the Toka Collective's Nothing Can Hold Us Back theme song for this show. I have played it on one of the earlier episodes, so if you're a real keener and you've listened to all the episodes up until this point, you will recognize that song. However, it's been a while since I played it, so I figured I'd give it another spin. With intermixed between it, a different kind of song. This is going to be a non-Creative Commons song, but one that is kind of notable on its own, and I wanted to talk about this at some point. But this is from the AP Wire, so this is the, of course, French news service. Quote, from Paris AP, French President Emmanuel Macron on Wednesday, this is Wednesday, mid-February, week of February 26th, ordered a small, little-known organization run by a rapper Dissolve, i.e. the rap group that produced that little bit of uh, gangsta-sounding rap, quote, ordered to be dissolved for alleged hate speech and defending terrorism. So here's the French government listening to this song and going, this is too far, this is way too far, and it's not acceptable in France, so we're going to make that particular band illegal, everyone involved is going to be arrested or disbanded, and the music is going to be totally illegal now. So what you just heard was totally illegal to listen to in France, so if you're in France... I hope you didn't listen because you uh, violated your listener's license. No, but the, the artist involved was a, a Killuminati, Massa X, and the song is Terrorist, which is basically their jihadist, Sunni Muslim idea of what the big, strong, idealized version of their ideology is, which involves a lot of singing the same note over and over and over again. Repetitive, a little bit of a catchy beat in some spots, but, I mean, th- the beat is not also not that complicated either so there's that going on and it also seems to like portray terrorism as this kind of party atmosphere like let's blow up a bank who knows but let's do it in a way that we can like hoot and holler and have a good time and that's kind of how it's being portrayed in that song which is kind of i don't know it's, it kind of rubs me a little bit the wrong way personally i understand where they're kind of coming from and trying to make it seem all sexed up and all inappropriate and therefore attractive. But at the same time, what are they talking about doing here? They're talking about harming and killing people, which is, I mean, yeah, it's, it's the outsiders. It's the, the, the dimmies or the, the kaffir or whatever, but it's still, they're trying to make it seem appealing using the medium they have. But it, again, it, it's this ideology of hate that is kind of put in the Toka Collective song. And it's really clear in this song. It's so blatantly clear what's going on and what they're trying to do and here it is here it is in the musical form so the the big question is so this song totally illegal totally illegal in france can we use it can we copy it because it's in this form that we can easily copy it digitally technically it's a easy thing for a person like me to do is it legal to, to remix it? Is it, it, it legal to, to take it and to repurpose it as an example of maybe things not to do? Is it, is it legal to, to steal it, to just take it and to use it? And what's wrong with that? Where's the harm? Where's the harm in taking a piece of terrorist propaganda outside of the fact that maybe we're spreading terrorist propaganda? But on the copyright law side, what exactly is the harm of stealing from a group like that, of stealing from the hostage humanist generous? of taking from this illegal and disbanded rap group and making it something useful. That's my question for the day. So YouTube content ID bot, come at me, bro, because I just took that and pirated it. Arr. And the reason that I, part of the reason I did that, by the way, is someone actually pointed out this week that it, it was like, Jeff, you seem like one of those people who follow the rules all the time. And that as a rule follower, you live within the lines and you do what you're told. And especially in relation to this COVID thing, that apparently I'm seeming too much these days as a normal person who does just what everyone else is doing for the sake of it or for the sake of following the rules. And here is my little example of hopefully by now you will see that I'm not that type of person (laughs) that... Who else is going to bring you terrorist propaganda, totally blatantly breaking C-51 and copyright law at the same time to make this show kind of interesting on its own? Because where else would you hear this? Uh, And the other thing I want to kind of point out here is that doesn't it kind of sound like gangster rap? Just a little bit? And why? Why is that? Why are they so uh, attracted to that that particular type of genre? What is it about this, this idea of a strong man 
rapping into a microphone. What exactly is there that's so appealing to that particular rap group? I mean, I guess I could ask them in French if I could formulate my question, but why? Why that genre? Why not Why not something like Strauss? Why not something like... Uh, I mean, it's France. Don't they have anything more interesting than this in France? I, I, I would have thought they probably did, but uh, who knows? Maybe I'm just not into rap enough. I mean, again, there were some parts of the song that were kind of catchy. I, I will give it that. But again, is that illegal to say in Canada? Can we say that? Can we say that that little bit of the song is catchy? Is that too far? Is that breaking C-51? Is that within the rules? I don't know. But it's something to think about. Anyway, so that's our little fun portion of the, the episode today. And so, but that's not the only thing going on in the world right now. There are a couple other things. So first, but before I want to get into the rest of the world, uh, on the, the, the topic of this show and the meta of this show, uh, a couple episodes, one Adam Knudsen was on this show. And I just wanted to point out that Adam was right. I know for some people it's hard to hear those words. There's a lot of people who disagree with Adam on a lot of different things. But the show was on the, I believe it was the 26th of April. And Adam made a good point that was, if the lockdown continues, and if people can continue to be locked out of their place of work and their place of income, one of the things we can expect is civil unrest in the United States. And sure enough, his date, he said, probably around a month, a month or two, one month after this show, we can expect civil unrest in the United States. And what happened a month to the day? Well, a month to the day minus one was the day that George Floyd was killed. And then the first bit of protest to follow that came the next day. The civil unrest in the United States happened exactly a month and a day after that show. He hit that target on the nose. He hit that target on the bullseye in suggesting when civil unrest was coming. So I think Adam deserves a little bit of praise for knowing his stuff on that particular prediction. Obviously, it was a little ambiguous, so does he know exactly what's going to happen in the future? No. But still, he gets some kudos for that. But going on to the news, we have from Zero Hedge, that always totally accurate source of news, quote, Facebook nerfs news feed will prioritize original reporting demote stories by anonymous authors. da 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 we got i3 is butchering the focus for the stream. Do I have an RTSP link? No, I don't have RSTP. Uh, that is something that we could probably do in the future, but I just don't have enough hands to actually turn on that many streams at once. Uh, if I had a helper here that I could, like, turn on Twitch, turn on RTSP, turn on all these other streaming services so that I could actually just start them back to back to back to back. Uh, I would totally do that, but I, I just don't have the physical manpower to do that. So good idea, though. I will keep that in mind for future shows. But uh, continuing on with the story, quote, as a flood of advertisers suspend their campaigns on Facebook over, quote, hate speech, perhaps the convenient excuse they were looking for, Silicon Valley social media giant announced that starting today, they're radically altering the way people see news, prioritizing original reporting while demoting stories from anonymous authors, according to a Tuesday announcement. Let's actually go to that announcement here. What form is this announcement in? Is it a video? Oh, it's from Facebook, about.fb.com. That's their official PR uh, website here. So prioritizing original news reporting on Facebook. When we ask people what kind of news they want to see on Facebook, they continually tell us they want news stories that are credible and informative. Today we're updating the way that news stories are ranked in the news feed to prioritize original reporting and stories with transparent authorship. So it's interesting, though. Facebook, they, their hat is in the game. They have, they stand to benefit when people are strongly identified. So right before we even get to the meat of this, we really should point out that Facebook's business is identifying people and keeping this social graph and keeping the information of who is identified by what means, by what institution, exactly what their credentials are, and so on and so forth. That is Facebook's bread and butter. So if they're saying, oh, for the public, we are encouraging news in order to be seen by the readers that they're looking for this news, they're going to have to be identified. And there are consequences to this. For example, the real names policy that Facebook has struggled with, that Google struggled with, with Google+. Plus, where When they say not anonymous, 
they mean that there's a real quote unquote name attached to that. And that if you require for someone to have a quote unquote real name, that means that, for example, trans people, or tra people who have, are transitioning from one gender to another, they have a legal name and then they have the name that they portray themselves as. And sometimes they're transitioning from one name to another and there's some paperwork involved with that. But Facebook and Google uh, in the past have required those sorts of people to basically identify themselves under their legal name rather than the, the name that they wish to be referred to by. Same thing with things that are published anonymously by groups like, for example, Anonymous. I was just reading a, a press release by Gizmodo from back in the day this week uh, in relation to the Eric Brown video that I just posted on my Facebook feed yesterday, where the Gizmodo was making a point that Anonymous the collective of uh, hackers and activists a good half decade ago now was publishing things through WikiLeaks, again, another organization of pseudo-anonymous people. So you have these multiple groups of people doing important journalistic work, important research work, work that has a public benefit, a large public benefit in the, in the context of anonymous and in, in the context of WikiLeaks, but plenty of groups that are doing interesting and important things that are not by named people. And so what Facebook is basically saying here is that those sorts of groups, the WikiLeaks of the world, the future WikiLeaks, the things that don't exist yet, that are only possible because we have an internet to connect us, and to connect people who don't necessarily have to identify each other to each other, and to collaborate and to do cool things on a global scale, that sort of thing, we're going to turn the volume down a little bit. We're going to make it a little quieter. We're going to make it so it's not as accessible to people who are trying to learn about the world. I just saw a video uh, just this past couple of minutes where I think one of the links either on that or somewhere else on my feed was making the point that, at least in the States, something, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's something like half of the people in the States don't even try to look for information to basically research before they go vote and to make up their mind of how they're going to vote, etc. They just wait for information to kind of, uh, through social osmosis, come and find them. And so the point here is that Facebook is used for this, and, and so we have all this information coming to us in the modern way of, of learning and deciding how to vote and making all these important decisions in our lives is to rely on the people around us, and the people around us are feeding us through this media, this intermediary of Facebook, and what's happening here is that the named people, the people who are playing, around, playing with the game, playing along by the rules of Facebook, i.e. identifying yourself, having a strong identity, having uh, credentials that are approved by Facebook, those groups, those people are going to be more successful, more able to get their message out, more able to get their audience, more able to set the narrative, because again, Facebook, they're playing to Facebook's benefit by their doing so. So, continuing on. This will only apply to news content, which again, is a big deal. Original news content. Original reporting plays an important role in informing people around the world from a breaking news story to creating in-depth investigative report, uncovering facts and data, sharing critical updates in times of crisis, broadcasting eyewitness reports. This important journalism takes time and expertise, and we want to make sure that it's prioritized on Facebook. We will be prioritizing articles on the news feed that we identify as original reporting on a developing story or topic. We do this by looking at groups or articles on a particular story topic and identifying the ones most often cited as an original source. We'll start by identifying the original reporting in English language, in English language news, okay. And we'll do the same for news in other languages in the future. So uh, English language speakers, you are the guinea pigs here. They're doing you first, so look forward to that. Quote, most of the news stories people see in the news feed are from sources they or their friends follow, and that won't change when multiple stories are shared by publishers, publishers are in the loop here, and are available on the person's news feed, we'll boost the more original one to help it get more distribution. So again, underlying this assumption is that there is a publisher there to produce and to publish this, basically. That the independent journalists probably aren't going to be as able to have that strong identity and to have that publisher to be able to make use of this and to benefit from this. Anyway, continuing on. Defining original reporting and the standards for it are complex, so we will continue to work with publishers and academics. Always interesting to see those two. Uh, so we uh, then it talks about transparent authorship, which we've already kind of talked about. Quote, how will these changes impact publishers' content? And blah, 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 blah. So again, they're, they're worried about how it's going to affect the news 
industry, they don't even mention what is the impact of this going to be or expected to be on the people reading, other than maybe, oh, we're just giving you more of what you want. Well, of course, when they define what you want, that is an easy thing for them to give you, right? So anyway, continuing on the zero hedge side, Ad. Continuing on, uh, in other words, Facebook will be now better control what information users are exposed to, as opposed to allowing content to organically trend, and articles written anonymously are now considered unsuitable regardless of merit. Facebook does acknowledge that in some areas, transparency can put journalists at risk, so we are only doing this in limited markets to start, taking into account press involvement in which publishers operate. However, we're guessing that that's simply legalese designed to cover that base. We shall see. According to Axios, which is a news service type thing, quote, the company will use artificial intelligence to identify which original stories to promote, which means subsequent reporting that provides missing context or alternate views on events will also be muted. Which, by the way, that's, that's us here right now. We are providing alternate context and alternate views. So in other words, this, this change, this major change in how Facebook and news operates around the world, which again, anytime Facebook changes something in regards to news, that's like changing how a billion plus people see the world. And it changes how the news works. It used to be that it would take decades for news to change in a big way. It would take a major or big company starting small and growing big and then making waves and having academics talk about it and all, all kinds of criticism levied against it. And there's a huge amount of friction involved with changing the way that news works around the world. Right now, Facebook makes a code change, pushes to GitHub, boom, it happens. AI is now involved in this part of the news process. It's involved in deciding what narratives are acceptable, what narratives are going to be talked about, what is going to be seen, not seen, etc. Continuing on, Axios also notes that Google is admitted to adjusting its algorithms last year in order to boost original reporting, i.e. this is not just a Facebook thing either. This is a coordinated attempt by the big tech companies to change the way that people experience the world and see the world around them and are able to intelligently deal with the information in their lives. Where have you heard this? Is this on CBC? I don't know. So continuing on, that's not the only thing going on in the world, Facebook messing with us. Let's see here, kind of re related to that. There's a link here that I don't know exactly how real this news is, this particular story. There, there's been some inconsistencies in exactly what happened here, but the original tweet this is from the police department is this here. This is from the Sergeant's Benevolent Association uh, from the NYPD. So this is basically they're uh, trying to convince the New Yorkers that police are necessary and important parts of their community. Uh, quote, homeless man literally set on fire last night in the streets of Brooklyn. Take a close look. Not one person can be seen defending this victim. Not one person seems to care. No protesters to condemn. No news media to tell the story. Well, obviously the no news media to tell the story part didn't turn out to be true because they found it and they shared it on the media that is Twitter. And Twitter might pretend that it's not a media source, but it totally is. So the story itself, again, I don't want to really get into that, whether it happened or not, whether it's true or not, uh, whether it's important, blah, blah, blah. What I wanted to get to is something that you can learn if you take a first year psychology course. And there's an article here from Psychology Today, and it is the bystander. And if you haven't heard of the bystander effect, what it is, is this tendency of people, when something happens, when a crisis happens, when a violent incident happens, when someone needs help, someone cries for help, the gut instinct reaction for most people, and this includes most of the people listening, like the vast majority, is going to be to keep walking, ignore it, to let someone else deal with it, even when you have the ability to help. So there's basically two kinds of crisis situations. There's the crisis situations where you can do something, you have the option to intervene in some way, shape, or form, and then there are the crisis situations which are way bigger than you, and you're not able to meaningfully intervene at all. And what the bystander effect is talking about is the first case, the case where you have the ability to intervene. Maybe if you believe in this sort of thing, you have the ability to call 911. You have the ability to ask others to intervene. You have the, the ability to call a friend for help. You have the ability to just physically get in the middle of people and physically do something to resolve the situation. Maybe if somebody's on fire, you have the ability to 
who knows, help put out the fire, try to extinguish it, maybe take off a shirt and like bat them with it or something to just like get the flames to no longer be lit, to, to remove the oxygen from the situation. Who knows, right? There's lots of things and, and a lot of different crisis situations that can come up. It's really not clear what you would do unless you're in that situation. A lot of situations are unique. A lot of them aren't. A lot of first aid, the entire first aid course is basically running through a list of situations that can happen and then walking you through what you should do in that situation. So we can go through different kinds of crisis situation, but the point of the bystander effect is there is this disconnect between what we do, which is nothing by default, and if you are in a crowd of people, so if you're like in a, a situation where there's a lot of people standing by, by default, everyone's going to expect someone else to intervene. Everyone's going to expect someone, the person involved, to get help from someone else. The default human emotion, the, the default human reaction to a crisis situation of of this kind, where someone is lit on fire, where someone is being raped, where someone is being attacked, where someone's having a heart attack, where someone's having problems that are just immediate and an emergency, and you, someone should react. The default response for most normal people is to go, I'm just, you know, it sounds bad. There's someone screaming, someone needs help. I hope someone else helps them. And it's not even necessarily a conscious thing. You're just, again, by default, going to do nothing, not going to get involved. But once you know this, once you know about the bystander effect, you can know that this is a default, this is a, a bias that we have as human beings to not intervene. And so you have to immediately think to yourself, whenever you're faced with a crisis situation like that, am I being affected by the bystander effect? Am I not intervening right now? Is that what I'm doing? Or should I intervene right now? And I would suggest that if the crisis is a situation of the kind where you can meaningfully interact and do something about it, that you immediately spring to action and, and do something because the bystander effect will bias you towards not doing that. And you can save lives. You can prevent people from being raped. You can defuse situations if you step in and get engaged with them. And again, I'm not going to like judge in this particular context whether it's a good idea or not to call for 911 or something like that. But that's the sort of thing that you could do if you're faced with a crisis situation of this kind. And the bias, the default is that we are, again, whether it's fear, whether it's just inaction, we're slow, we're, we rely on other people. And this is just a bug in the, the hardware and wetware of how human beings work. And it's something to be aware of. And so psychology today here goes in, so, quote, so social psychologists uh, Bib Laton and John Darley, if I'm pronouncing that right, popularized the concept of the bystander effect following the infamous murder of K Kitty Genovese in New York City in 1964. The 28-year-old woman was stabbed to death outside her apartment. At the time, it was reported that dozens of neighbors failed to step in to assist or call the police. And they attributed the bystander effect to two factors, diffusion of responsibility and social influence. They perceived uh, diffusion of responsibility means that the more onlookers there are, the less personal responsibility individuals feel to take action. I.e., the bigger the crowd, the more you're likely, as a human being, with this problem, to just let it play out, to let the bully beat the little guy up, to let the, the woman get sexually assaulted. The more people that are around you and not doing anything, the more social cue you have to basically not intervene. And this, again, if you step back and look back at the situation after the fact, a lot of the time people will say, well, why didn't anyone intervene? Why didn't anyone call the police when this uh, Kitty Genovese was getting raped and murdered? Why, when these terrible things happen, does nobody do anything about it? Well, part of the reason is this bystander effect that we diffuse responsibility into a crowd way more than is logically uh, or morally acceptable, even to our own moral self and our own moral guidelines. It is rare that a person has an understanding of themselves to the extent that they understand that, oh, okay, something's going on, and I have the ability to intervene and, and do something about it, and I'm going to not just choose to, to opt out. That's a lot more rare than this particular effect. Quote, oh, social influence means that individuals monitor the behavior of those around them to determine how to act. Again, so you're in a crowd of people. One of the things that determines what you're doing when you're in that crowd of people is what the people around you are doing. If everyone's doing the wave, you're going to be tempted to join in. Peer pressure is a real thing, especially when groups get really large. When you have a whole stadium full of people, when you have a whole crowd or a riot or a mob or a group, a large protest, or any kind of really, really large, packed in when people are really close to each other, 
that is going to make the bystander effect a lot bigger. And so they go into, like, what can make it worse, what can make it better. But the way out is to be an active bystander, to realize that the bystander effect is a real thing, and that if you act, other people are likely to help you, because you're leading that social example. You're setting the example for other people. You're leading other people just by acting. And you can, as an individual, as an active bystander, make a huge difference in somebody's life if they're experiencing a crisis, if there's violence going on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that being said, there are situations that you can get into where it is really important that you don't intervene. If you are a small person and there's a fight going on and there's, like, let's say, five or six people beating a smaller person up or just being, beating anyone up, if you're not able to meaningfully take on five people and you don't know what you're doing and you don't have any martial arts training or something like that, maybe it's a good idea to not intervene or at least to think very carefully about engaging in violence with larger groups of people. As one of the episodes before I described, unless you're armed, taking on the police is probably a really bad idea and you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble very quickly if you try to bring violence to the police. Or even just like intimidation or aggression or anything like that. If the police are acting out in a violent way and you don't have the bigger, stronger force to prevent them from doing so, again, think really, really careful about what you're doing. It is one thing to be an active bystander and to do something when you have the ability to do it, but you're not always going to have the ability to do it. Sometimes there are just going to be situations where you get in where it just gets out of control and there's nothing you can do about it. And your safety is at risk if you intervene and you're not... Again, that, that's a choice everyone has to make. Is it worth sacrificing yourself to save that one guy getting stomped by five other guys? Personally, I've known people who have done that sort of thing and who have successfully diffused the situation by getting involved and making it more complicated than the five guys originally intended. It can happen, but it's something to think about when we're talking about the bystander effect, which is, again, an important effect. It affects all of you, you out there listening. You are not immune to this. You are not immune to this. You, if you are faced with a situation like that, are likely to not do anything unless you know about the bystander effect and know that you're going to fail to act and act accordingly, given that knowledge. So why did I bring that up? Well, thing number one, right, Facebook is doing something that affects the whole world. The whole world right now is being affected by that choice, by that software change, that choice of how news is being presented. Are you going to do something about it? Or are you going to diffuse that responsibility to everyone else? Well, that's a choice I'm going to leave up to you. So, continuing on. Speaking of things that affect the whole world and change the way that people can perceive the world, Stefan Molyneux was just kicked off of YouTube. Another person kicked off of YouTube. And this is a person who had hundreds, if not thousands of videos. They would have taken hundreds, if not thousands of hours to make, and dozens, if not hundreds of hours to upload and to make the metadata correct. This is a huge investment by the, on the part of Stefan Molyneux and the Free Domain Radio crowd, which agree or disagree with them. They put their arguments out there. They tried to argue in a rational and logical sense what they believe to be true and to, to make a case for it in the marketplace of ideas. They tried to make a case for what they believed in a peaceful way. They tried to make a case for what they believed on the order of rational and reasoned debate. And they tried to advocate that others do the same thing, that others respect the autonomy and boundaries of other people, that others who could be prone to violence, that could be prone to not respecting the consent of the people in their lives, Listen and try to, to appreciate the value of consent and to pr appreciate the value of a society where consent is an important value. This was, at least in my experience of watching a couple of these, maybe even a couple of dozen of these videos, the core of his worldview, that everything else around him was, and all of the political views and all of his opinions that he espoused and the hundreds of other videos, all of it came down to the respecting of consent and the respecting of other people and the respecting of boundaries of other people and trying to think of how could we get along as a world? How could we get along with each other? How could we get uh, convince each other to live peaceably? How could we do that? Well, the first step is to find that minimum set of things that everyone consents to, that everyone understands, this universal picture of the world that we already have 
that we already share. He was doing something very similar to what John Dewey was doing in the common faith. He was trying to find this bedrock that you could build a society on. He thought he had it. He had this, this universal moral behavior that he, then he could build on top of. He made his argument for it. And I think there is something to his approach, and there is something to his attempt at getting consent from everyone at that level. And whether he was successful or not, and I'll let you, of course, judge, but this is what he was doing. This is the thing that got him banned. This is the thing that made it so dangerous that he was trying to reach out to people and trying to, to have a world that lived at peace. Stefan Molyneux really tried to have this bedrock of consent as this value. And here we are now with this missing voice, this gap, this hole in the debate, in the discourse of the world with hundreds of thousands of views per video, I'm sure. The thing that people could rely on to, to reference to, to make comment on, to communicate with others and say, hey, this sounds a lot like Stefan Molyneux's idea. All that's now gone and removed from YouTube. And we are really at a loss here. Now, is Stefan Molyneux completely banned from the internet? No. There are other places on the internet you can go to. BitChute is one of them. And it is still possible to ex experience these ideas, but YouTube is a major platform, a major gateway, a major place for people of the world who have computers, cell phones, and the ability to listen to what other people say and think and to, to ask questions, to argue, and to reason, to struggle with the ideas and the people involved, that happens on YouTube. And here again, we are faced with a situation where a large voice, a prominent voice, a philosopher, a person who tries to live up to the ideals of philosophy as a practice, as a thing that you can do, and does so on a level at which that just glorifies actual rational debate and using the, your mind to its utmost to examine the world around you. This is the person. This is what we are banishing. We are expelling from our world that Google is sending out of the Athens that is YouTube. We're replaying what happened to Socrates in this banning. That is what is happening here. Now, again, you might disagree with some of his views, and that's fine. He has his own views, and we can get into those particular views, but at least as far as that moral bedrock, that idea of consent as value, that idea of using this universal picture to try to build a world from it, we are really at a loss without someone to clearly and with great skill explain that idea. That idea, I think, had a lot of value to it, whether or not his estimation of exactly where the contours of that were, he was able to express it really clearly. We we're really at a loss without him on that. So that was going on. I think I'll go into one more story here today. So this one's from Michael Geist, quote, No opinions permitted. Broadcast panel rules jokingly criticizing Canadian content during radio news segment violates code of ethics. The Canadian Broadcast Standards Council has ruled, got a link to this ruling here, that a news broadcast that it jokingly criticized Canadian content violates the Canadian Association of Broadcasters, Code of Ethics, and Radio Television Digital News Association of Canada, RTDNA, Code of Journalistic Ethics. The complaint arose from a December 2019 broadcast on Toronto station CFRB. David McKee used his lead-in to report on a possible Netflix tax to state that libraries of streaming services like Netflix, Disney Plus could soon have more Canadian flavor that nobody watches or wants if the federal government gets their way, or its way. So that comment was too much for one listener who filed a complaint with the CBC, arguing that Canadian content is important and that Mr. McKee seems to forget that he's part of Canadian content broadcaster. His opinion should be kept off of the regular news sections and limited to a specific commentary section if he is so transfixed on being a commentator that the CBC agreed, taking aim at the words nobody watches or wants, which it concluded constituted inserting personal opinion into the broadcast. And then it goes into a little bit of the details of that. As a penalty, the CFRB must now broadcast that it breached the ethics standards on several broadcasts. While a few will likely take notice, Canadians should take notice of the regulatory policing of the line between news and commentary on a radio broadcast. Indeed, one wonders if there will be a similar outcome if the broadcaster had expressed support for Canadian content. And moreover, the Broadcast and Telecommunications Legislative Review Panel, which Canadian Heritage Minister Stephen Wilbo plans to implement, recommended extending the Canada Broadcast Regulatory Framework to the internet. That includes this show including sites and services that aggregate the news. That'll include Twitter. The panel referenced the Broadcast Standards Panel 
stating that it's part of the system used to suppress misinformation and manipulation. It continued with the recommendation that the federal government introduce legislation with respect to the liability of digital providers for harmful content, harmful, and conduct using digital technologies, separate and apart from any responsibilities that may be imposed by communications legislation. The fear then and now is that the recommendations would invariably lead to increased speech regulation online in keeping with its questionable conclusion that it is all part of the, quote, Canadian broadcast system, i.e. They're talking about increasing the scope of this panel that already is seeing fit to sanction and to punish for criticizing Canadian content, which, by the way, if you've ever listened to commercial radio, you will know that what happens is they play a bunch of the big hits and the big popular great artists of the RAA or the, the music of the day that everyone at least has been pale, uh, repetitive, brainwashed into thinking is what they want to hear. And then every once in a while they throw a crumb at the CRTC and the Canadian government and play a Canadian nobody that nobody wants to hear. And this is the way that commercial radio in Canada works. They play their Canadian content, the Canadian government bureaucrats are happy, and the musicians who they, they play are happy because they get radio play. And then they're able to get away with the Americanizing of Canadian culture the other 23 and a half or whatever hours of the day. That's just how things have worked forever here. And as a consequence of this, the quality of the Canadian content they play tends to be lower. It tends to be not what people are actually interested in. It tends to be, or as this McKee put, a Canadian flavor that nobody watches or listens to. They'll literally switch to the next channel at a much higher rate. They'll turn the radio off rather than listen to whatever this crap is, right? This is just the way things work here. It's the consequence of having a regulated broadcast media, as Canadian broadcast radio is, in the way that we've done it. And it's worth saying as much. It's worth saying so. We can, I guess we could dance around it and ignore the problem. We could just pretend that, oh, maybe some of these Canadian groups really are good. And what they really need is just that little bit of exposure that they're able to get through this particular government intervention in this market. That's arguable. But at the same time, we can't deny that there's crap on the radio, right? We can't deny that the other consequence of this is there are things that nobody wants to see that get to be on TV because of this. And that everyone's time is wasted. Everyone, and then of course, more Canadian content is produced. Crap is produced. Stuff is, is produced that nobody wants to see. And it's able to squeak into the, the broadcast media, again, because of this intervention by the government. Now, what is one of the ways out? Well, one of the ways out is what we're doing right now, is having Canadians broadcast on the internet where they're free to create and to build their own music and to make their own movies and to remix Canadian culture and to do something useful with that Canadian culture and to not be restricted by groups like the CRTC and the copyright laws here in Canada, which stymie and prevent great works from being made and broadcast on the internet, especially if criticizing Canadian content is verboten. It is, that is what is going to get us out of there. Because when we're free to broadcast, when we're free to, to create and to express and to find our audience on the internet, there is this incentive to actually do a good job at doing so that is just simply not there in the current system with the CRTC regulation of ensuring that there's a necessary minimum of Canadian content. Now, personally, I have for many years of my life tried to have a little bit of a bias towards Canadian content. Consciously, Obviously, on an unconscious level, I'm going to have a bias because the content that's recommended to me is going to be recommended by the people in my life who are, again, Canadians. And yes, there's this media machine in the States. There's this media machine in the NPA, the RIA, the IFPI, and commercial radio that encourages us to experience media in a certain way. But there's also a tendency, and this was remarked by even Adam Smith, that people want to deal with the people local. Local is a way, it is basically nearby. It is something that we are going to be tending to be involved with no matter what, just by the fact that it is local. And we can build on that. As artists, we can build on that. We can start local. We can start appealing to the people around us. I mean, it's not the only way you can start. You can always find just some niche that is interested in the things you're able to create and the, to grow from there. That's fine. And if that works for you, go do it. But what's broken right now in Canadian culture is this expectation that the government can mandate what people watch. 
and that the government can then control who gets access to the gatekeepers and the government can control what is acceptable culture. That is currently broken. So that is probably all the time we have today. And as usual, if you're interested in more broadcasts of this kind and more illegal music, perhaps, or probably more likely in the future, legal Creative Commons music, you can freely copy without risking jail time. The place to go to is subscribestar.com slash Jeff Dash Cliff. And I want to make a little side note on that. I want to be able to do more with this show, and I'm not going to be able to do so without there being investment on some level, on some scale. Now, I will put in my little bit to it, and I have continued week by week to do so, but it would help if there was more support. And the way to, to make that support happen is to go through Subscribestar. So other than that, I will leave you for the week. If you have any music creative commons or perhaps uh, dangerous and uh, forbidden to spread to the world, uh, definitely send a link to me where I can check it out. Or if you have anything you'd like me to talk about or any guests you'd like me to involve in this show, make a comment or send me an email, jeffrey.cliff at gmail.com. And with that, I will leave you for the week. Looks like we're a little over, so I'll skip the goodbye song and I'll see you all next week.